This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Horticulture Spell to Rushing, and I'm broadcasting live from West Texas. I mean, real West Texas, out beyond the cactus. So uh, for the next hour or so, if you want to talk about gardening, I'm live. I'm, my heart's in Mississippi. My garden's in Mississippi. Be glad to kick around some ideas with you. Uh, it's toll-free, one eight seven seven mpb ring If you want to give us a call, just bring it on. Uh, meanwhile, I'm uh, staying at the home of Ron Knight. Uh, I've spoken out here before to his master gardeners. Ron is a, is a, a local hardcore digger and determined independent gardener. He's got a, a new house in suburbia. I mean, real suburbia, where the houses are all the same basic style and the same size and spaced and, you know, and the streets are nice and neat. They've got homeowner associations and all that kind of stuff. But he's got the coolest garden because it's got a lot of Texas native plants and wildflowers, all in neat beds. His uh, his garden art is uh, is Texas century. But get this, where all the neighbors have got uh, Bermuda grass lawns that have to be mowed with a real mower, you know, the kind you push the this not a rotary mower, but an old fashioned real mower, uh, have to be watered two or three times a week. Have to be all that kind of stuff. He's got artificial grass, and we're talking about one of the top garden guys in the area with artificial grass and it looks good it looks the same style same size same texture it even has it's not old-fashioned astroturf it's even got brown uh stuff woven into it to look like thatch which gives it a natural color you'd be hard-pressed just driving down the street to tell which lawn is real and which which one is Ron's because the new synthetic turf is so realistic and talk about practical. It really works in an area that gets less than 20 inches of rainfall a year. So anyway, if you want to talk about gardening, give us a call. Uh, Java is going to be t- letting me know who's calling when and kicking around some ideas. Uh, also, if there's any events you know of, some garden-related events I can help promote, give us a call about that. Let's, sh- let's share what's going on in your community. So uh, one of the things that I'm talking about uh, out here is slow gardening, about doing what you can that makes sense to you and savoring what you do. Gardening all year, uh, not just paying somebody to come in and mow and blow. That's, that's fast food gardening. Nothing wrong with that. But if you really savor what you do, you really like homegrown tomatoes and, and uh, you don't mind an occasional spider web and things like that, uh, if you're really in tune with your garden year-round, that's called slow gardening. So you, finding what you do best, enjoying what you do, savoring it, and sharing it with others. And so that's what we're doing here. So uh, Java, understand it's going to be a little bit cooler, but a little bit more humid this weekend. Is that right? Well, I don't know about that. The the humidity has really, really kind of dropped. So you know how it's it will get to ninety degrees, but it'll feel like a hundred and ten outside. It's actually a cool, if that's possible, ninety degrees this morning. It was. Uh, uh, 57, like, you know, the kids needed a little light jacket um, if they were going to be outside anytime. So if we're getting a little fall preview right now. Well, you know, that'll get everybody's use of going, which is good. This past week I went out, uh, Java, went out, visited a couple of friends at Garden Center, spent some time talking with Herbie Austin. We have him on uh, on the uh, Gestalt Gardener from time to time. Uh, Herbie sort of represents the Garden Center managers around the state. Uh, he knows what's going on. He knows what's coming down the pike. He has to plan ahead sometimes a year or more to make sure he's got the supplies and equipment and plants he needs. But he says the people are starting to pick up, uh, sort of like the last call for putting winterizer on the lawn. We recommend getting your, your, your late summer, your fall feeding done, getting ready for winter sometime around the first part of September, which we're sort of still there. So if you want to winterize your lawn, you want to take care of your grass, make sure it goes into the winter looking good and uh, staying healthy through the wintertime, fewer weeds and, and green up really nice next spring. Uh, that's what they call winterizing. It's done before winter. You're getting it ready for winter, not waiting to winter to do it. So this would be a good weekend to put out a winterizer or that second uh, feeding of your lawn if you like to fertilize a lot. If you don't ever fertilize, it's a good idea at least every three or four years. And uh, this would be a good month to do it. Not going not gonna to make your grass too tender if you go ahead and get it done. 
Uh, also, I picked up some cabbage plants. I picked up some broccoli plants. I, and, Java, I even picked up some cauliflower because I'm determined we're going to grow enough cauliflower for you to show me how to make your your uh, your uh, barbecue cauliflower, hot, uh, hot cauliflower wing type thing. Yeah, so, uh, you um, uh, Jackson State has another, another football game this weekend, and I was talking with my mom earlier. Uh, she and my dad are going to the game, but I'm going to be here in Jackson and I'm going to watch it on TV and I may, I may make some cauliflower wings because if you haven't tried it, I got to keep putting it out there. It's the same texture as Buffalo, uh, Buffalo wings, the boneless Buffalo wings. And then, I mean, you, you sauce them up real nice and you dip them in your ranch or blue cheese and you cannot tell the difference. And and this is raw. It's not cooked or anything. You just break them off and and uh, make sure not any worms on it. And just dip it in straight off the stem, huh? Yeah, you you got you do um you know you bread them and coat them and then put them in oh, the oh. yeah and put them in the oven. Yeah, we're not eating raw cauliflower. Oh. <laughs> well, you 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 can you can. Yeah, you can, but that's not but that's not what we're doing here. <laughs> okay, so in other words, find any good chicken wing recipe and substitute cauliflower. There you go. Pretty much, pretty I much. I got you. I got you. I thought you'd just use like one of these little fancy uh, you know, dip things. You know, you see cauliflower and celery and stuff like that on a tray with some dip. But no, you're frying it up like a like a real man. Yeah, it gets yeah, because I said <laughs> it gets, it gets it gets really soft and it and it makes it makes for a nice uh substitute. But we do got some phone calls for you, Unfeld, if you're ready and, there. I am, but and you don't have a bone to throw away. All you got is fingers to lick. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Simple okay. and easy. Who who we got? All right. Well, let's start off today with um, uh, the capital city, Becky in Jackson. Good morning, Becky. How are you doing? I'm doing just great. How are you, Felder? So far, so good. It's uh, going to get up to the upper 90s today in West Texas. But I'm, I'm going out to visit a couple of gardens this morning. I'm going to get off the air before it gets too hot. What's, what's going on? What can we help you with? Well, I was just kind of wondering if you had an idea. I want to start a root garden. And uh, what would be the best things that are easy? Because, you know, I've got this fractured back and cancer. But I want... I want. I have a little bed, and I want to know what what would you start with with some vegetables. Okay, when you said you you, you said uh, what kind of you said root garden or or what kind of root. garden? Yes, a root. I like uh, root vegetables. Oh, I got you. Uh, carrots and beets and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, have you already got the beds made up? Already got the little raised beds done? Yeah, the beds, the raised beds are already there. Yeah. Well, the main thing is, uh, you know, dig, dig your, you know, dig the dirt where it's nice and loose, at least six or seven inches deep, because uh, if you want carrots, for example, they need to have pretty good dirt so they can grow as straight as possible. And be sure you choose the right variety. This past spring, I planted uh, late winter. I planted some. Uh, carrots. I was real proud of them. They looked great, but when I pulled them, they were the size of my thumb. And come to find out, I had bought a variety called Tom Thumb. You know, and for the same amount of space and effort and time and all that, I could have had something you know three times as long. So choose the good varieties. Uh, the most important thing w- with those again is loose soil, um, not too much fertilizer, just enough to get them started. Uh, and then when the when the seeds come up. Go ahead and put a little bit of mulch around them to kind of keep the ground cool and loose so it doesn't pack down in the rain. Um, uh, other than that, the, the biggest uh, – do you grow beet? Do you like, you like beets? Yes, I like to make boars. Okay. okay. Well, but beets uh, – a beet seed is not a seed. It's a cluster of seeds. And what I do is uh, with the carrots and beets and those kind of things, I, I, I sow the seeds real thin so I don't have to thin them out later because otherwise you've got to thin them out. They've got to have elbow room or they won't make roots. You know, space them out two or three, four inches apart. Uh, so sow your seeds and then just wet it down. You know, don't water it. Just sprinkle it enough to get the seeds wet and then lay a board or something on top of it. That keeps the ground shaded and moist and cool. And after a few days, lift the board up. And and uh, maybe sprinkle again, and when they first start to sprout, then get rid of the board. But but just just wet them down to get them started, and cover them up uh, until they sprout. That'll really help them uh, come up a lot more uniformly. Okay. Um, only right. the only other thing I can think of. See if you can find. Uh, you may have to go online to find this. But there's a type of radish. It doesn't taste like radish. It tastes 
well, it tastes like a radish, but it's not hot and spicy. But it's, it used to be called um, Long Beach Long Red because it was grown 100 years ago by the, by the train car load down in Long Beach, Mississippi. They even have, have uh, radishes on, their, on the Long Beach city flag. But I think it's called Cincinnati, Cincinnati Market Red. But they're long like carrots, and from seed to eating is about three and a half or four weeks. From seed wow. to eating, and they're, they're they're long. They're not hot and zesty like regular things, but they grow fast. They grow long, and you get a lot of produce for the small space pretty quick. But uh, don't the closest I found, I think it's one called Cincinnati Long Red or Cincinnati Market Red or something like that. But the description would be long. Red and mild. They're really good producers. Now, what about jicama? Have you ever grown any jicama? I, I have not. I have not. Uh, I'm not. I, I think that it needs to be planted in the spring for summer. I'm, not, oh, okay. I'm thinking. I'm thinking about planting stuff for now, which could be turnips, uh, beets, um, radishes, carrots, things like that. And need to okay. go ahead and really get get started on that soon because. We want to make sure you start producing something before it gets too cold. Okay, I'll do it. Well, say, say howdy to Texas okay. for me. I love oh, Texas I, people. They I, are so I will. It, it, let, me, let me throw out one more. This past weekend, I, I also got some turnip seeds. I haven't planted them yet, but I got one called Tokyo Cross. It's a white-rooted turnip, and they, they're they sweeter than the old purple-top turnips that everybody plants. So play around different varieties. Try some of the white varieties of turnips and see if they're not a little bit sweeter. Okay, thank you so much. All righty, have fun. Appreciate it, Becky. Okay. okay, what's up, Java? All right, Feldo, let's, let's go ahead and take our first break for the hour, but we do have a full bank of phone calls, Michelle in Gulfport, uh, Diane in Gaucher, Barbara in Olive Branch. We're going to get to you after um, the other side of this break. All righty, folks, I'm broadcasting live from, from West Texas. I mean, way past where the trees start slowing down. Uh, a little place called San Angelo, and uh, we're going to be talking with Master Gardeners about getting the most out of their gardens. And um, we're talking about a, a tough climate. It only gets about 20 inches of rainfall, and it gets hot and stays hot, but it also gets cold in the winter. So different challenge, but gardening is the same. doesn't matter what style, what kind of plants. It's still putting stuff in the dirt, green side up, and watering it enough to get it started and hoping for the best. If you've got some things you'd like to talk about, give us a call, toll-free, 1-877-MPB-RING. We'll be right back with more of the Gestalt Gardener and other folks here at MPB right after this. Hi, I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center and host of Southern Remedies Relatively Speaking. Join us as we explore issues that relate to you and your family, from mental health obstacles and family interactions to handling life disruptions. Whatever the issue, let's try to figure it out together. You can listen live Tuesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. You're listening to an encore presentation on MPB Think Radio. We're not able to take your call right now, but you can always reach us through email. The address is garden at mpbonline.org. This is Mississippi Public Broadcasting, Think Radio. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Horticulture is fell rushing. And Java, you say we got some callers on the line. That's what we're doing this morning. So who are we going to start with? Let's go to Barbara in Olive Branch. All righty. Barbara, good morning. How are you today in North Mississippi? Oh, just fine. Good, good, good. I've, good. I've, I've got some kind of insect that I do not. I started out having what I know were white flies on some of my potted plants. Now right. there's some there's some little white insects about it all in the shape like of a mosquito and it is everywhere. It's in my grass, it's on all of my potted plants in uh, one flower bed. Very, very you know, short. 
Yeah, you know, without seeing a, a really good, clear close-up picture, I can only guess what it is. But in general, uh, most of the time, these type of insects don't do as much damage as a larvae does. And it could be that you've got some that are laying eggs, and their their little tiny, tiny larvae might be sucking some sap out of the plant, and then the adults fly around. Uh, most of the time, it's really hard to get rid of these without spraying more than once, you have to spray the underside of the leaves because that's where they are. That's where they rest. Uh-huh. That's where they lay their eggs. You have to spray the underside of the leaves, um, and and then you have to repeat it because you may kill those that are there, but tomorrow some eggs are going to hatch out, and then the, uh-huh. the sprays don't last very long. So you have to spray at least twice, maybe three times, five or six, seven days apart, and you know that's a lot of trouble. If you know, if you could, if you could ignore it as best you can, white flies are really irritating. It's just clouds and clouds. But mm-hmm. the cost for control means you got to spray stuff that's going to also kill the little things that feed on them. So yeah, that's that's mm-hmm. the only solution. Um, and there are some, some safe in, there's some safe insecticides you can use, but the only one I would recommend not using is what they call seven. Seven is for chewing type mm-hmm. insects, but. Uh, there are even some natural insecticides. You might even want to try mixing up a little dish detergent, just a little dish detergent, in a gallon of water and spraying the underside of the leaves. A lot of times that will cover up and suffocate the larvae of tiny little insects. So you might want to try, mm-hmm. you know, we're talking about a maybe a, a teaspoon or a tablespoon in a gallon of water. That might help. Okay. And these are kind of in the shape, I would say, of a mosquito, but they are right. well, very small. <laughs> There's, there's, you know, the fly family. Mosquito is in the fly family. So are white flies. There's so, there are thousands of different kinds, hundreds and even dozens in Mississippi. And for the most part, they're an important part of the food chain. We just don't see it uh, because they, they bother us when there's a lot of them. But anyway, mm-hmm. with, with, again, without looking okay. at it, so many of those little flies look mm-hmm. alike to me. But the control or ignoring them is the same. Well, I just may do that and hope they go away. <laughs> Well, they, you know, they may or may not go away, but, you know, if they're out in the lawn, there's there's nothing to worry about. And there's tiny little spiders out there. And sometimes when the dew is heavy, you can in the morning you can see all the little webs. That's what they eat for a living. And then in turn, other things eat them. So in the, I, I would only worry about it on really valuable plants that are up close okay. to where you are all the time. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, good luck on it. Appreciate your call. Uh-huh, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Sir Java? All right, Felder, let's go to Diane in Gaucher. Diane, woo, we, went from, we went from up north to down south. What's going on, Diane? Yes, I planted some snapdragons in the container, and uh-huh. uh, they froze a few months ago, but they just right. came back up. So Ooh, what, do I, what do I do? do I, can I take them? Because they're in a big container with the other ones. Then come back up. Yeah. What well, do I that, do to that, make sure they continue to strive? Well, it sounds like you, I would just make sure they're not too thick, and to give them just a little bit of fertilizer. Felder, I think you were going to say give them a little bit of fertilizer. Can violas can take a hard freeze. Snapdragons won't take a really really hard freeze, but they like our winter time better than they like our summer time. They plant snapdragons outside in the up north in the summer and in england in the summer but we plant them in the fall for winter and just hope we don't have a hard freeze so a little bit of fertilizer water them and then if we have a hard freeze i mean you know down below the mid-20s i cover them up just during that period but they, okay, they like now, cool weather so if you got them through the summertime you got it made now fertilizer what kind of fertilizer do i use slow release or Plants that work. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Felder, she Hello. was asking. She was asking what kind of fertilizer should re, should she use? Um, uh, slow release fertilizer. Job, are you there? Felder, can you hear me? All right. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty right now. Let's go ahead and go to our cheesy tune while we get Felder rushing back on the line this morning. You're listening to the Gestalt Gardener right here on MPB. Think Radio, you can give us a call right now. Well, actually, you can't. We have a full bank of calls. We're going to go down to Gulfport when we come back. John in Mobile and Gene in Mobile. 
And uh, we appreciate all our callers who've made our show possible this morning. So stay tuned. We're going to con- reconnect with Felder. But we do have a cheesy tune coming up just to break things up as we do each and every Friday morning and Saturday morning right here on the Gustav Gardner. Okie dokie, we're back. Java, can you hear me all right? I can hear you. I could always <laughs> hear you, Felder. You just couldn't hear me. <laughs> Here, here's, here's the deal. Here, I hope I didn't say anything nasty. <laughs> what, what, I'm, I'm, use, I'm staying at the home of uh, Ron Knight, and his, I'm using his wife's phone because it's got a, a, a head jack connection, and mine doesn't. But anyway, apparently when she walked in the room, it switched from the headphones that I was listening to to her hearing aid <laughs> so we were shouting in her ear so yeah i want to apologize for being so loud in her ear <laughs> that's so that's okay she, she's gone now but that, that's a first that's a first broadcasting live in martha's hearing aid <laughs> <laughs> now let's continue on the phones because we have a full bank and let's All right, uh, man. let's go talk with michelle in gulfport let's get on hey michelle good morning how are you hello Hello, how are you? We're on the air. Oh, good. Thank you for taking my call. I have a question sure. about uh, 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 Little Gem Magnolia. Right. Uh huh. I have, okay, I've purchased it recently and I've got it in a container. I don't know right. how long I can keep it in a container and I'm not sure how much to water it when it's in a container. Well, those are good questions. You can keep it in a container. For years, if you put it in a bigger pot, you know, I've seen it grown oh. in Delaware. I've seen it growing outside in Delaware as a container plant, uh, and a lot of ple- people use it, but it needs a big pot, bigger than you can put your arms around. Uh, but are you okay. eventually going to put, are you going to put this in the ground eventually? I think so. Yeah, it, it will do better in the ground because it is a small tree, you know. So if you keep it in a container, you're going to have to water it all the time. Even in the wintertime, if it dries out, you've got to water it. So uh, if you're going to keep it for a while in a pot, just make sure it doesn't stay dry. You don't have to keep it sopping wet, but make sure that it doesn't stay dry. And um, if you're going to okay. put it out in the yard, be sure to dig a wide hole and loosen up the potting soil and the roots. I see so many shrubs and small trees suffer and die two or three years after putting the ground because people didn't loosen up the potting soil or roots when they set it out. So main thing is keep it keep it watered until you get around to plant it. And when you do plant it, wide hole, loosen up the roots, and it'll do fine. All right, then. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, well, let me ask you this. Does yours have flowers on it right now? Not now. It did. Okay. But- but I, I noticed uh, my son's uh, was in full. Little Jim is the longest blooming magnolia, and it's not unusual for it to have flowers even in October. So anyway, I hope you enjoy. It's a cool plant. I do. Thank you so much. All right, appreciate your call. Who, who's up next, Java? Uh, let's go to Mobile and talk with John. All right. Hey, John. Good morning. How are you, sir? Good morning. Good morning. Howdy. What's up? A uh, question for you. I have a um, sapling in the front yard, a small tree. Um, uh-huh. the, the master gardener in the family, she who must be obeyed, tells me that that tree needs to move. It's right under a power line. Yeah. What so kind my, of tree what, is it? Do you know? 
I think it's a water oak. I, I have previously sent to you on your email address a picture of it, but I haven't heard anything back from you. But I, she yeah. tells me it's a water oak. My question yeah. is, when can I transplant that that uh, tree? Uh, well, the, the best time to, to transplant is going to be in the fall after we've had a little cool weather, which you don't really get in Mobile until December. But uh, late October, November, December, January, that would be the best time to move it. Uh, you know, sp- after it's dropped its leaves or in some, some cases, not tr- oak trees don't drop all their leaves uh, even at, uh, until we get a well into the winter. But when everything else has started dropping its leaves and going dormant, that'd be the best time, the earliest I'd move it. Give me tree transplanting 101. What what are the basics how, how, involved here? How, how, how tall is the tree? I'd say it's about four meters tall. Ooh, that's tall. That's tall. Um, it, it's about it's about a, an inch in diameter right now at the base. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, for, let me preface this by saying I used to w- work on a tree nursery. We grew trees in the field. We dug them. We planted them in tra- – so I've dug – countless trees and a tree that big i would have a hard time moving and here's the reason why you can only move a root ball that's about maybe two two and a half feet or so across without it breaking out under its own weight uh and in order to do that you've got to cut off most of the roots because if you st- if you stick your arms straight out wiggle your fingers that's where the feeder roots are so you basically you're cutting it to just root nubs if you're going to do it, do this. Go out for the trunk about a foot or, or so all the way around, you know, a, a, a circle about two feet across. Cut straight down all the way around, straight down. And then go outside that and make a second cut uh, six or seven or eight inches wide outside the first one. And then use your shovel and dig out between the two so it's standing up in a moat. Then you can take your shovel at an angle and cut up under it all the way around. So you basically cut all the roots without moving the tree at all. And then to okay. move it, if you'll roll up a, a towel or something up under it and sort of rock it back, and sort of like change it to be able to somebody in it and roll something up under it, you can pick it up by the towel or the piece of plastic or whatever rather than by the root ball or the stem. If you break the root, the tree's going to die. See, so it's really important to get a root ball that's no more than about a couple of feet uh, wide and maybe a foot or so deep. Easiest way to do that do is dig a trench around it, cut up under it before you ever move it. Uh, and I've I done this you. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. I'll give it a try. I, I know that I won't be around to enjoy it, but I, w- I would think that maybe 40, 50 years from now, the, the tree's out there and it will bring someone from the... Um, well, you know, one one other thing you can do, and this is this is not this is not what the master gardener has to say, but you know, you can also cut the top out of the tree and grow it like a wishbone tree, where it grows around the power line instead of right up into it. This sounds kind of weird, but we do it to shrubs. All the I've seen this done to trees many times. So you know, you could deliberately grow it in a wishbone shape by just cutting the top of it out. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and any bra- any branches are growing up. Or towards the center, just cut those out. In other words, only leave branches that are going up and out, so it so it grows around it. Does that makes sense. I see. Yeah, it does. That's interesting. Okay, thank you all for being there. I appreciate it. Y'all have a good day. Okay. Hey, good luck on it. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Felder. All right, let's. Um, we just talked with John and Mobile. Um, Gene and Mobile just dropped off. If you are uh, still listening, Gene, and you can, please give us a call back. But let's go to Rebecca in Fulton. Hey, Rebecca, what's going on in, in way up in northeast Mississippi? Well, I'm looking at the waterway right now, and it is just absolutely gorgeous weather today. Just gorgeous. Uh, in, in, any fall color showing up yet? Not, not much. Not um it's it, no not yet i mean but yeah but, uh, a little bit but soon. not not much yeah but, soon. Um, but anyway um uh, i hope you're having a good morning uh so far so good you know i'm I'm broadcasting live from a strange phone out in west texas but it's all going so far <laughs> so good what can we help you with yes sir um i'm calling because I, I took your advice about emptying out stuff, uh, emptying out dirt out of your um, 
out of pots and mixing it up, like you said. Right. Uh, right. And I, I put it in a little red wagon. But in the process of doing that, one of those pots was next to an Althea bush. And there are those little bee ants, uh, and they're all over the place in that yeah. dirt. And I'm just trying to figure out what would be the best thing to use I want to plant some seeds in there and, you know, get some fall flowers, but what would be the best thing to use on that not to kill what's going yeah. to be growing well, up? Yeah. Uh, these, are, those are, these are just those little black ants and not fire ants, right? No, the, well, they're, they're little bitty ones that, you know, you know what the other... Yeah. Uh, right, 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 right. They, 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 yes. they crawl on you, but they don't sting you or anything like that. Right. Well, you can just right. ignore them. You can just ignore them. They're not a problem. Matter of fact, they actually loosen the soil a little bit. So, you know, it, oh. unless they're just really irritating you for some reason, they're really not a problem. You know, when they get into potted plants, if you bring them indoors, you know, then that could be a problem. Uh, you know, just like when they get in your kitchen or your bathroom or whatever. Uh, but for the most part, you know, if you wanted to use one of these little ant bait type things, you know, that'll take them out. But if they're out in the yard, in the garden, I wouldn't worry about them. They're not a problem, really not. They just bother us. They don't bother anything oh. else. Okay. Well, uh, are they going to be eating stuff that I that I plant in there, though? No, no. That's that's not that's not what they do. Uh, a lot of times they feed on the little sugary, the little extra, the little you know the sticky stuff that comes out of plants. But they, mm -hmm. no, they they they're not they're not veg, they're not vegetarians. It, no, it's not. A, if if. One thing you could do is just simply irritate them and make them move, you know, water them several times and just make them move. And you could try putting citrus peelings around there, you know, anything that sort of uh, – there, there's oil in citrus peels that, that repels ants a little bit. So, you know, maybe, you know, get you an orange or lemon and, and you know, sort of make the zest with the, with the you know, scrape up the, the, um, the peels and put it around there and just make them move on. But I wouldn't worry about it. They're not going to really cause any problems. Okay. Well, thank you. All righty, enjoy. Take your glasses off. The problem goes away. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, bye bye. I think you. I think you made her day, uh, Felder. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, just just if you can't fix it, flee it, or fight it, flow with it. Well, let's flow to this next phone call. And uh, Gene, he graciously called us back. Gene in Mobile. Hey, Gene, what's going on, man? Hey, I'm sitting on his front porch waiting on you to answer this telephone. <laughs> well, here we, here we are. What's, Look here. What, what's I, got, I got a hydrangea I bought about six weeks ago in a pot from a nursery, and uh, I want to know what's the best time to plant it. Now, later, next month, what? Uh, is this uh, uh, one of the, the Chinese have this with the real slick leaves? It's the one with the white thing on it. I can, I can uh, tell you the name of it if you want me to if I go and look at it. Well, the, the main thing is there's different kind of hibiscus. If this is the kind that... Oh, here hydrangea. was a hydrangea. I'm sorry. Hold on. I'm sorry. Oh, hi, okay. Okay, hydrangea. I, I yeah, can't read my own handwriting, man. That's okay. That's okay. You can plant it any time you can dig a hole, and it's too hot to dig a good hole. But, uh, as soon as, you know, if you'll start digging on the hole until you're satisfied with it, be sure, you know, to make it wide. And it's really important because these have been grown in potting soil in pots. That's not good when they put them in the ground. It becomes like a socket that stays too wet and dries out too fast. So be sure to um, dig a wide hole and loosen up the potting soil and some of the roots when you set it out. And it's not the best time for doing that because plants are hot and dry. But oh, no, I'm not going to do it right now because it's too hot. That's the reason plant to start with. If I were to cool it off a little yeah. bit more, but I'll just go yeah. to the well, winter time and fall would be good then, would it? It, it, as soon as you can get around to it, I'd, I'd wait at least another month when it starts cooling off a little bit. But I'd start working on the hole soon because if you try to do it all <laughs> at one time, you're not going to do a good enough job. That you you must have seen me shovel, shovel with a shovel, you know. No, I, no I know how it is. I know it had, is with me. And if I try to do it all at once, you know, those plants going to be a stuck in whatever we, hole we dig. So, that's, well, I, and so well, you know, I, that's where you I, need to. I'm 80 years old, so I ain't going to get no big hurt, you know. Yeah, there you go. Well, we'll, we'll go out and do a little at a time. One other time. thing, Christmas cactus, you got any tips on those? Not really. Uh, you know, this time of year, they start sitting their flower buds based on, this is really unusual. When the days start getting shorter and cooler in nature, it also gets a little bit drier. So if you want them to set good buds, don't let it stray, stay dry, but but 
wait a little bit between waterings. You know, keep it on the dry side. Right. Uh, and 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 that that's what that and the shortening days is what triggers the flower bud formation. So just don't keep it too wet. Don't push it with too much fertilizer. You don't want it in sunshine, right? Oh, well, they, they don't really like a lot of sun. You know, they, they they like sun from the energy, but they don't like hot midday sun like you get down in your neck of the woods. So right. uh, bright, bright indirect light. Main thing is let them get dry between soakings. I'll do that. Appreciate it, man. You have a good one. All right. You take Thank it you. easy, Bye-bye. guy. Appreciate it. All righty, John. How we doing, man? Uh, we're doing good. Now, it's, it's up to you. You want to stay on the phones or you want to go ahead and take a quick break? Well, let's stay on the phone because right now we're on a roll. Well, let's go and talk with Gail in Long Beach. Hey, Gail. Good morning. How are you? Hi. Gail. Howdy. What's up? Hey, I have fun in my yard, and I can't get rid of it. Well, yeah. Fun? I'm, I'm what, doing... what, what's a fern has well, taken over my yard and my garden. Oh, okay, just regular fern, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, this is. And, and keep in mind, I've got degrees on top of degrees, and I've been a garden expert for forty years. Blah 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 blah. And all I do is I just pull it up as best I can. Now that that's that's what works for me. Well, I mean, I'm talking a lot. I, I know, I know. I, I totally anything get kill that. It? But Does anything kill it? Yeah, we weed, weed killers will kill it, but then you got a bunch of dead ferns. So you know, if you want to spray it with a weed killer, you can. But you know, in in the long run, you're gonna to have to dig up the dead stuff anyway. So anyway, is is if you don't have any other plants in the area, you can use weed killer. It'll kill ferns, but you know, then you got a bunch of dead fern out there. So, I mean, I'm not trying to be contrary. This is something I have to deal with in my own garden. And um, one of the things you could do is put your bird bath out there and call it a fern garden. You know, go with that flow. <laughs> fern garden, like right? Well, you know, call it a, you know, a, a fernery is what they call it. But, you know, the other thing is if you could put something else out there with them that makes it look like they're a big ground cover. My mother used to deal with when she had plants that were really weedy that spread, her solution was to plant stuff in with it that was bigger than they were. See, so if you put like a little small tree, you know, in other words, go with the flow, but if you want to get rid of them, if you're going to spray them, keep in mind the spray can kill other stuff if, if you get it on it. And if you can't spray them because of other stuff, nothing else to do but just cut them down and dig up the little shallow roots. I mean, that, that, that's what I would do. And if there was something easier, I'd do it myself. Okay, Sorry. sounds like a plan. Thank okay, you for your time. It, 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 it's easy to say. It ain't easy to do. <laughs> I know. It sounds about <laughs> backbreaking. <laughs> Good luck. Oh, and, and by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be down at Long Beach uh, in, next month. Let me see. When am I going to be there? I'm going to be in Long Beach. No, I'm sorry. I'm going to be at Past Christian Library on October 17th. Maybe i see you there. Okay, well, well, that's right next door. All righty. All right. Well, thank you for your call. Appreciate I'll see you then, hopefully. Good luck on it. All right, Felder, before we take our uh, last break for the hour, let's talk with Debbie in Sandy Hook. Hey, Debbie. Good morning. How are you today? Hello. How are you? I'm just fine. How about you? So far, so good. What's up? I'm curious to know about... um, Planting some miniature rose bushes, when is a good time to do it, and what should the compost be? Oh, well, well, first of all, roses grow in better in part dirt and part compost than all dirt or all compost. So what I would do, is, is this going to be in a, like a flower bed or in a pot or what? Yes, sir, it's going to be in a flower bed. Okay, what I would do is I would dig the dirt that's there, good shovel deep, you know, dig it as good as you can, and then spread some compost or manure or something like that on top and stir the two together. It's easier to mix them together oh. if you dug the dirt first. And then spread two or three-inch layer of stuff and then stir it in like crumbling crackers in a bowl of chili. And then it's really important. <laughs> I say this 
uh, it, this is exactly what it's like, crumble up crackers on top of chili and stir it in. If you put too many crackers, it ain't chili anymore. So don't overdo it with the right. compost is what I'm saying. And then it's really important, when, even with miniature plants, to loosen up those roots when you pull it out of the pot. It's really important to do this. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. Yeah. It's, uh, if you what pull a, a plant right, right out of the pot and stick it in the ground, it becomes a socket that stays wetter or drier than the dirt around it. So you want to try to get the plant growing in one type of stuff by mixing stuff with your soil and then loosening up some of the potting soil. Well, when you plant it, and other than, and you might also also want to think about putting some little daffodils or little pansies or something in between the plants over the winter time, so you have something to look at all year. Oh, okay. Well, that's a good idea. Now, when should I plant these miniature roses? Anytime you get around to doing a good job, d- d- work on the dirt, get the dirt right, and then um, you know we're close enough to fall to where as long as you're gentle and don't you know as long as you're not really brutal when you pull the plant out loose and the roots up, you can go ahead and plant them anytime you get around to it. But the, the ideal okay, time yeah. would be in uh, in October or so. But let's get the dirt worked up really well first. Okay. Well, thank you, sir, very much. Okay. Good luck on it. Thanks. Bye bye. All righty, Java, you said we're going to take a little quick break? Yes, sir. All righty, folks. I'm uh, out in San Angelo, Texas, uh, doing a talk for Master Gardeners. I was out here four, five, six years ago, and they had me back. And got plenty of new stuff to talk about with this new book out called Maverick Gardeners. Uh, by the way, I'm on the uh, Mississippi Gardening Facebook page. If you're on Facebook, check out Mississippi Gardening. There's several Mississippi Garden-type things, but Mississippi Gardening... Um, it's, a, it's a fun little site where it's got real gardeners helping each other with questions and showing off the pictures of the plants and what's this spider and what can I do about this and sometimes we got solutions sometimes we just give each other big old hugs and help get through the get through the stuff so anyway we're going to take a real quick break and come back with more of the Gestalt Gardener here on Mississippi Public Broadcasting right after this Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. For the culture is still rushing. And uh, let me put a couple of things on your calendar. One is, uh, well, both are in October. Uh, one is going to be on October the, um, excuse me. Let, me, let me check on this. I lost my place here. Here we are, October 17th, which is a Sunday. I'm going to be at the Past Christian Library at 2 o'clock talking about mini meadows and uh, lawn alternatives and pollinators and all that stuff. That's October 17th. But on October the 1st and 2nd, I'm coming back to the Max and Meridian. On October 1st, we're going to do a live broadcast of the Gestalt Gardener live from the Max and Meridian, October 1st, Friday. And on the 2nd, uh, at the max, October 2nd, Saturday, I'm giving a talk on how to make your garden look great all winter without a whole bunch of care. Uh, stuff you can plant in the fall or stuff you can plant any time that can make your garden look as good in the wintertime as it does in the spring, summer, or fall. It's possible in Mississippi to have color and texture and flowers and even fragrance in the dead of winter. That's what we're going to be talking about. October 1st and 2nd, folks in and around Meridian, heads up, we're going to have some fun. So we got a caller, uh, Java? No, that's what I was going to say. While we're waiting for our last, um, maybe our last call for the hour, um, if we can sneak one in, um, what are uh, uh, maybe one or two, I don't want you to give your whole <laughs> your whole spiel away, but what is one or two of those flowers that will pop with color during the winter? You know, everybody thinks it's going to be all drab and, and stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people are off the bat. You know, they just, they, they, they know about camellias. The sanquas that bloom in the fall and December, the camellia japonicas. But if you put them out there deliberately where they where you can enjoy them in the wintertime and put a big bird bath or something around it, we have birds in the wintertime, and uh, even on a cold, freezing day, they'll come to water. But we have paper white narcissus that start blooming sometimes as early as Thanksgiving, usually Christmas in uh, December and January. We have all sorts of early-blooming daffodils. Uh, there's a shrub that's called flowering quince 
that blooms in the dead of winter. We have hellebores, little uh, evergreen ground covers that bloom in the winter. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, we've got lots of those kind of things. Plus, you can put a, a nice big pot of stuff out there with a combination of, of colorful kale, some pansies, some snapdragons. In other words, you can create a color spot with a pot full of winter annuals without having to have a whole bed full of stuff. So we have shrubs. We have texture plants that have got good evergreen color. Um, I'm thinking Akuba, that's green with yellow spots on it. There's a wonderful shrub called Mahonia uh, that has the most incredible chains of yellow flowers in January, uh, early February. Uh, so we've got plenty of stuff that blooms in the winter. Uh, it's just a matter of pulling the individual plants from here and there all into one spot so that they all t- together create a really pretty scenic, colorful, texture, flowering type of scene, middle of the winter. It's possible by just looking around and seeing the individual plants around town and then pulling them together into one spot in your yard. How about that? How am I doing, Java? No, you pull it together because I always, you know, when I see uh, nice-looking gardens um, at homes during the wintertime, I just say, wow, they just have the magic, you know, they have the magic. But it's actually some, uh, you know, it's it's some things that they're actually doing that's not, you know, not too hard. You just yeah. have to know what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, one of my favorite plants is a, is a shrub called Nandina that has kind of a feathery foliage. It's called Heavenly Bamboo. And uh, it's loaded with clusters of the red berries in the middle of the winter. See, if you put a Nandina with the red berries right beside a camellia with flowers with some paper white daffodils b- beneath them and maybe a bird bath or a, or a pot full of uh, pansies, you've got a little combination there of individual plants in one spot that is, is show-worthy, world, world-class. It's just a matter of seeing what does well and pulling them together into one spot, a nice little focal point. So anyway, that, that's that's the approach that I use. And I see this when you go to England, uh, English gardens, all the botanic gardens got an area that's set aside to be at its peak in the middle of the winter. We're talking about an area that's on the same latitude as Nova Scotia, but they pull all these plants together into one spot, and people flock to it just to have some, some winter color and texture and shape and all. It's just a matter of, of combining stuff. So it's like going to a buffet and choosing stuff that, that you like. So a, a nice little anyway, complimentary plate. <laughs> that's that's right. That's right. You know, if you're gonna, you know, you know, your 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 uh, your chicken, your your what do we call it, cauliflower wings. Yeah, boneless cauliflower called? wings. Boneless cauliflower wings with some potato chips on the side. You can't you can't beat it with the with the uh, Jackson State football game on a Saturday. <laughs> that's right. And and where's they're playing? It's it's it's, it's Pretty far away, isn't it? I forget. Yeah, they're going up uh, 55, going to Memphis for the Southern Heritage Classic. Um, yeah, go Tigers. That's right. Go, go Tigers. All righty, folks, we've muddled through another one. Somehow we've managed to get through another hour talking about gardening. Um, I'm going to be back in Mississippi first part of next week, and we're going to be live from, from the studio. Uh, if you've got some things that, can, that uh, we can help, promote let us know about it meanwhile we're going to take a quick break come back in a week relax refreshed got some stuff planted in the garden going to talk about what you can plant in your own garden if you get a chance this weekend take a kid to a farmer's market the garden centers are getting loaded with stuff take them to a uh, to a garden center help them load up with some plants show them how to do what we do best and that's get dirty see y'all next week